Wonderful. So um, welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to um, the final summer webinar that is offered by Persia Educational Foundation. We will be back in September with a new um, um, series of webinars and in-person events. Uh, but for now, we are delighted to have such a rich panel this afternoon to um, address our audience. As you know, Persia Educational Foundation focused on providing um, opportunities for um, Iranian descent students in the UK and beyond. And part of what we do is, of course, focus on uh, providing scholarships um, to uh, Iranian descent students who are studying in the UK. And part of our services to the community involves providing educational spaces, such as these webinars. Uh, the webinars are designed to provide information about advancing both professionally and uh, academically in a practical manner for the Iranian community um, and friends of the Iranian community in the UK. Um, today, we are joined by three brilliant um, young professionals who are changing the world of law. Uh, we have published their um, detailed um, bios on our social media and on our website. So please get to know them if you haven't already done so um, on Persia's website and social media, uh, primarily LinkedIn, Facebook, and um, Instagram. Um, so without taking any more of their time, I'm delighted to, to welcome Leila Mansouri, Shafa or Lawrence Yousefian, and Victoria Tamri. Um, there are three amazing individuals who are doing a great deal, uh, both professionally and for, for their community, regardless of uh, background. And um, they are trying to really make a positive contribution to those who stand in need of legal representation and access to law um, and rights. Um, Leila will be speaking um, first to share a little bit about her journey into the world of law. Um, then Shafa will, will speak about how he has uh, become a barrister. And then finally, Victoria will share uh, a bit about herself and the wonderful work that she's doing as a solicitor. So um, Leila Jun, we are eager to hear from you. You're, you're a known face to the uh, Iranian community in the UK and US. And so it's wonderful to hear a little bit more about how you have um, ended up becoming a lawyer, um, what um, was your path to um, so to that, I mean, um, area of work and um, um, where you are going next. You're always doing amazing work. So we are eager to hear from you. Welcome to, to this webinar. We're all ears. Oh, we don't have your voice. I think you're on mute. <laughs> okay. Now we can hear you. Super. Hi, everyone. Okay, great. Thank you for joining. I'm Leila Mansouri. Uh, I'm going to try to be my most authentic self today. And please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have any questions after this. I'm happy to help aspiring lawyers. And I can be reached everywhere. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, <laughs> Google, everywhere. Um, my journey into the law was probably a little bit cliche because as a young child, I always would stand up for my friends and I always would call out injustices and talk back to the elders and everyone would always call me um, Zabunderos, which in Farsi <laughs> translates to uh, the long tongue. Um, I didn't, I didn't like rules and I was a little bit rebellious and um, I was always kind of an activist. So fast forward to my adult years. Um, I should say though, I was not a top student. I always had average grades. I was, I would do well in some subjects, but I was terrible in math and science. And um, that's another reason why um, being the child of immigrants, you don't kind of know a lot of options. And 
everyone always said, oh, she's the lawyer. And I always kind of naturally knew that that's the way I would go. Um, so it was, it was a little bit of a journey to get it into law school in the U.S. Um, and it took some time. I wasn't successful right off the bat. I had to try harder and try again. Um, but I did. And that's why I think you should not give up if you don't get the test scores you want the first time or if you don't get accepted into the school you want. Don't worry, because you can always transfer later into the school you want. You can retake the test. The universe uh, will make it work. And um, where I'm at for the past 10 years or so, I've been practicing law. I uh, naturally kind of it started out doing immigration work and uh, during various, um, I, my background is from the U.S. and during uh, previous administrations, there were some unjust uh, immigration bans and rules and I, I kind of got thrown in um, to, to fighting for immigrants that way, uh, logged a lot of pro bono hours defending immigrants, particularly from the Middle East and um, uh, I happened to be, I, I found out that I like networking and I like organizing events alongside law practice. And I happened to join the Iranian American Bar Association, uh, in DC where I was. And when president Trump enacted travel bans against Iranians, I was the president of the bar association at that time. And so naturally I was called in to do interviews on TV and suddenly I was, I had to do media appearances, but I made it work because I am flexible and adaptable. And I think you have to be to be in this profession uh, to make it work. Um, the good thing is you can wear many hats and a legal degree can open a lot of doors and you can do a lot of things with it. So, um, but I currently have, uh, I currently work in pharma law. So I'm doing different kind of impact work. Um, I work on cancer drugs, uh, clinical trials for mainly cancer drugs. So I found a way to do impact because that's important to me to always have a positive impact in my work to keep myself motivated. And I was able to transition from immigration to pharma law at this time. Um, so I think just so you know, you're, you know, if you pick a certain field of law, you're not stuck with it forever. It is a little bit challenging to transition to other types of law, but it is possible. And it's really important to maintain your network, to ask for help, and um, and be open to new opportunities so that, you know, you're not stuck in one place forever. So, Tahir Jun, did I, did I do a good little summary or should I? Absolutely. I think that's wonderful. Thank you so much for for um, um, sharing, um, you know, um, so much of yourself. That's that's really wonderful of you. Um, um, I think you gave us a good opening to the sort of the journey into law from being an immigrant. Um, and with that in mind, of course, you know, I, I should emphasize that many of us we may come from the same background, but we have had a different life. Some of us are born overseas, some of us are born in Iran, some are educated in the West, some are partly educated in Iran. So um, all of us try to achieve our best. I think if there is one thing that we learn in terms of the values that inspire um, uh, expat or immigrant communities, whether it's first or second or third generation is to strive to become the exactly as I said the, the, sort of the the more your most authentic self and and the best live the best life that you can not only in terms of our personal life but in terms of the community that we're trying to build so with that in mind I suppose we could turn to Lawrence who um, has also had an interesting journey into the world of law and is doing amazing work Lawrence thank you Tyre thank you and hello everybody uh as her introduced me, I am Lawrence. Um, I'm a barrister and I uh, specialize in UK immigration, asylum and human rights law. Um, I, I'm going to explain the difference between barrister and solicitor shortly, but just to begin with, um, I've been asked to essentially set out my uh, route into law, my journey into law. 
I was, um, I am of Persian descent. My parents are both Iranian, but they were, um, they were essentially raised in the UK. Uh, but I was born and raised in Japan. Um, and so I was there until the age of 15, actually, uh, with Japanese, going to Japanese schools with Japanese friends. Um, my first language basically is Japanese. Um, and um, yeah, at the age of 15, as I said, um, I, I sort of always wanted like an international dimension to my education. And so at age 15, um, I moved to Canada on my own, uh, went to a boarding school, uh, spent the best three years of my life, uh, really polished my English. My English was horrible when I moved to uh, Canada at age 15. I, I yeah, it was, it, it was a lot of hard work um, initially at least. Um, but yeah, I went to high school in Canada. Then when I was in Canada, um, I decided to apply to law school in the UK, uh, primarily because, um, well, the reason I decided to do law was essentially, um, it wasn't a particularly deep reason. My dad thought I would be a good lawyer. Um, and so I sort of stumbled, stumbled upon it. Um, there wasn't like some rigorous personal uh, analysis of my motivation or anything. It, it, was, it was quite a superficial reason to just go to, school, uh, go to law school. I wasn't particularly motivated back then, I suppose, to be completely honest. But um, before going to university, so I got accepted into a university in the UK. The reason I decided to go to a university in the UK was because it, it's, it's actually shorter. You can go straight into law school and after three years, um, you can essentially start training to become a lawyer. Whereas in the, U, in the US or Canada as well, um, you have to go for an undergraduate degree for four years and then for, the three, for, for a three-year law school, I think. So it's a much shorter journey, which really suited me. Uh, before going to university, though, I did spend a year volunteering and doing service uh, for a year after high school, sort of like a gap year. I went to Wales and Guyana. And then I went to University of uh, Liverpool in the UK and studied law. Um, I didn't particularly enjoy studying law. Um, I think what becomes clear is that um, there's a huge difference between law in in theory and law in practice and i'm going to come to that in a moment but i think it's important to bear in mind that just because you don't enjoy studying law it doesn't mean that the career the legal career isn't for you because i i definitely did not enjoy studying law but i absolutely love my profession wholeheartedly and my i i i'm sometimes amazed that i get paid to do what i love so much um Anyway, so after uh, law school, I again took a year out after law school and I decided that um, I, I knew I wanted to do law, but I didn't know what area of law, which is quite a difficult thing. And I'm, I, I wanted to speak about this as well because deciding what area you, of law you want to practice um, is quite a big, big thing. Deciding to become a lawyer is probably only about one third of the battle. Deciding what area of law you want to practice is a much more arguably important and career defining aspect of, um, of, of, what you, of your future. And I think in recognition of this, I really wanted to get it right the first time, if you will, um, as to what, what area of law I wanted to practice. So I decided to take a year out. I worked at, as an intern at the International Criminal Court uh, at The Hague in the Netherlands. I was working on the defense team of several uh, alleged, obviously, war criminals. Um, then after six, seven, seven months stint in The Hague, I went to China um, and did, I was an, as an intern, as a legal intern in corporate and commercial law, again, just to experience different, different areas of law. So I could really make an informed decision. And then I came to the UK and did the BPTC, which is a course that you have to do to become a barrister. And um, after the bar, I knew that I was interested in immigration law. Uh, I liked it. I, had, I did a module in university, which I really liked. Incidentally, it was my highest score, highest mark, even though I, I didn't quite like studying it, nevertheless. Um, and I think my time at the International Criminal Court, I was also exposed to a lot of internally displaced people and refugees and so forth. So I was naturally intrigued about this area of law. So what I did is I researched the top 20 immigration law firms in, in London and literally called every single one to, to see if they have any paralegal roles. And 
fortunately, I was accepted onto one. Uh, I worked as a paralegal for three years and as an in-house advocate doing litigation work, which is basically what barristers do. And then I moved to a set called Richmond Chambers, where I did uh, my pupillage, which is a training, mandatory training you have to do to become a barrister. And then now, well, since 2019, I've moved to my current set, Goldsmith Chambers, where I continue to specialize in human rights, immigration, and refugee law. Um, yeah, just, just sorry, I, I don't want to go overboard. Just one final thing, just to explain the difference between barrister and solicitor, if you don't know. In the UK, essentially, broadly speaking, you can split this profession into two, the legal profession. There's solicitors and barristers. And again, broadly speaking, barristers specialize in court advocacy. So they are the ones who have the right of audience to go to court to argue the case. Solicitors do a lot of the uh, work concerning documentation, litigation preparation, taking witness statements, more client-facing work, and so forth, um, preparing bundles and so forth, and also obviously preparing applications and whatnot. So that's broadly the difference between barristers and solicitors. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Lawrence dear. This is wonderful of you to be so thorough, both in terms of your um, quite transparent about your personal journey, but also to uh, quite clearly uh, describe what was involved uh, in studying law and working in law in um, two different continents, because your education really came from North America, I suppose three, because you started in Japan and then went to North America and now here in, in Europe. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, I should mention that um, for those who are interested, because today we have an, an, an American lawyer and two British uh, solicitor and, and barristers, I should mention that I also have a degree in law, but it is a doctorate in law. So for those who are, who are interested in not necessarily working as um, lawyer, solicitor or barrister, but in, in um, advocating access to um, human rights, um, perhaps at a practical or even academic level, there is the option of, um, uh, you know, obtaining a doctorate in law, which enables you to um, uh, truly and, and, and uh, genuinely uh, work in the field with the grassroots populations, um, promote education, which is, you know, education and legislation are two, two pillars for accessing rights. So uh, there's also that option. But if anyone has any questions, you know, there will be other opportunities. And I don't want to take time away from our panelists today. So with, with these words in mind, I want to turn to our dear Victoria and hear from her, who is a wonderful family solicitor. So Victoria, dear, we're all ears. I'm Victoria, I'm an associate solicitor at a firm in central London. I specialise in family law and I deal with all areas including divorce, finance on divorce, disputes in relation to children, and protecting victims of domestic abuse and prenuptial agreements. Uh, by way of background, I have wanted to be a solicitor since I can remember, but my idea of law was always criminal law really. My mum is Iranian and works as a midwife but she used to do interpreting on the side, which she really enjoyed. And when I was about 10 years old, there was an Afghan plane that was hijacked and it landed at the airport near to where we live. And my mum was asked to do the interpreting on behalf of the police for the hijackers. And this really interested me. And one day she had to collect me and my brother from school and take us to the airport because my dad was at work and we actually met one of the hijackers and shook his hand. So that really sparked my interest. Um, when my mum lived in Iran, she was actually studying law at university and wanted to become a lawyer, but due to religious persecution, she had to escape and she ended up coming to the UK and becoming a midwife. So I was always very aware of that job role as it is what my mum wanted to be. Um, I have always been fascinated with the courts, criminals, prisons and those TV series. But when I got a bit older, after doing a couple of different work experience in different law firms, I went to a family law department and that's where my interest sparked in family law. So for education wise, because I knew I wanted to be a solicitor, I had to decide if I wanted to do a law degree or a non-law degree and then do a GDL, which is a law conversion. Doing a non-law degree would have taken me a year longer to complete and further expense because the GDL is about 10 to 12,000 pounds now. 
Um, a law degree interested me more than other subjects, as the only thing I really enjoyed apart from that was IT. So I decided to go forward with law. So after that, I knew I had to do my LPC, my legal practice course. And I chose to do this in London, as I knew I wanted to work in London after. Um, I paid for that myself, as it's rare to get sponsorship. And then I would knew I would be more attractive to law firms to get a training contract if I'd already done my LPC. The kind of firms that sponsor trainees are more the large international magic circle and corporate firms. And that wasn't an area that I wanted to qualify into. So I knew that it was really unlikely that I would find sponsorship for my LPC anyway. So when I finished my LPC, I didn't have a training contract. So I, my plan was to get a job as a paralegal, to get paid legal experience, put me in good stead to get a training contract. At that point, I was still interested in family or crime when I started my LPC. But in 2013, there were huge legal aid cuts, which destroyed a lot of law firms and um, crime departments. And at that point, I realised that crime would be really difficult to qualify into and earn money. So I decided to volunteer one day a week during my LPC at a local law firm in their family department. So that helped me get my... Um, that gave me a lot of legal knowledge at that point because I was drafting divorce petitions, preparing court bundles, drafting indexes, preparing financial disclosure, drafting letters. So I was actually doing everything a paralegal or a trainee solicitor would do. And that experience led me to my first paid paralegal role because my boss at that firm knew a firm that needed a paralegal. So that's how I got my first job. At my first job, they encouraged me to do my own advocacy, which is where I represent clients in court instead of us instructing a barrister. And a lot of paralegals don't usually get that sort of exposure. So I was very lucky um, and it led me to the experience I have today as I do my own advocacy now. Um, at, I, had, I was a paralegal for about two years. And at that point, once I got my paralegal job, while I was applying for training contracts, I was getting more and more interviews because of my, my experience was increasing. And after a number of interviews, I actually got my training contract in a very unconventional way because I had met the practice manager of a law firm at my gym and we chatted in the changing rooms. She asked my CV. I had two interviews and I was offered a training contract. So that's how I got my training contract. Um, on, tr on training contracts normally, you do three to four seats in different areas of law and you need a mix of contentious and non-contentious. So my seats were residential property, private client and family law and doing family law once again on my training contract and also doing other areas of law made me realise that family was definitely the right area for me. Um, I continued running my family law files and conducting my own advocacy during my training contract um, and luckily my other two seats were very complementary to family law so I still actually use the experience I got in those areas to help me today. Um, since I did my training contract, training contracts have changed a lot. Um, there are currently two ways to qualify now. One is through the legal practice course and a two-year training contract. And the other is through the new solicitor's qualifying exam, the SQE, along with a recognised period of training. The SQE route doesn't have a specific training contract element. So the good thing is, is that it accepts the paralegal experience as the recognised period of training. So in that respect, it's easier to achieve. But eventually the SQE is going to um, take over the LPC and the LPC will be phased out. The SQE can be done taught through a university like a master's degree, or you could self-study it to keep costs down. So the reason they made the SQE was because of the high cost of the LPC. Although I think the SQE is still quite expensive. So um, I've also been asked to speak about the future of my area. So the, with the future of family law, the courts are having their funding reduced more and more every year by the government, which is causing huge backlogs and more delays than ever. So we now encourage our clients to consider alternative dispute resolution methods, as we find that they're more satisfied at the end of the process because it's so much quicker and it, it actually works out cheaper because of, you don't have the delays. But um, um, due to the lack of funding and the pressure on judges, they don't really have much time to read the papers prior to hearings and they and often hearings can be rushed. 
So using these different alternative dispute resolution methods, both parties can choose an experienced specialist who has time to read all of the documentation in detail. And it means that the parties can be more likely to settle and be happy with the outcome. So if you are interested in family law, then it could be good to look into the different ADR methods as you can qualify as some of these once you qualify as a solicitor or a barrister. So I'll just go through a few of them to so um, you know what the alternatives are. So the main one is mediation. So your the courts encourage mediation and to issue an application for finances or for a children matter, you have to prove to the court that you attempted mediation unless you have an exemption. So you actually need to attend a mediation information assessment meeting with a mediator and they have to sign off a form to show that you tried mediation before the court will issue your application. And mediation is where both parties meet together with a trained neutral third party who will facilitate negotiations to assist the parties in coming to an agreement outside of court. So another, um, another ADR is collaborative law. Under this process, both parties appoint their own collaboratively trained lawyer and you meet face to face to work things out. Both lawyers are absolutely committed to settling the matter outside of court. Um, the next one is arbitration, which we're doing quite a lot of at the moment. Arbitration is where the parties appoint an arbitrator who will make a final and legally binding decision, which is similar to going to court, but a lot quicker and more flexible process. And due to that, it could be a lot more cost effective even though they're paying for the arbitrator. Um, and private FDRs, which is where both parties appoint a private FDR judge, who is usually a barrister who sits as a judge, to carry out a private court hearing. And the, the most new one at the moment is using one solicitor for both parties. It's actually very new and not many solicitors have been trained in this. It's currently being trialled, but it's seen as the future for many divorces for couples who are amicable and have shared goals. Um, so in terms of advice, it's very, very important to get work experience. I'd say that that's my biggest word of advice to people. Um, email any law firm you're interested in and ask if they have work experience available. A lot of firms have vacation schemes and if you do well on them, it could set you up for a training contract and you can put all of it on your CV to show your interest in becoming a solicitor. I also recommend to become active on LinkedIn and get more exposure and you can also contact solicitors at law firms through LinkedIn asking them about the opportunities. Um, also look for mentoring opportunities, a lot of university and firms offer them so definitely apply. Um, I'm currently a mentor now and it's, it's, really, it's really nice to help um, the mentee doing those things um, and I've also given my mentee work experience which is not always it's not always a definite thing of having a mentor, but sometimes you can get that. Um, if your university has a law clinic, definitely get involved. Do pro bono work and citizens advice bureaus are always looking for volunteers. Um, don't let rejection set you back. Law is incredibly competitive. Everyone has faced a lot of rejections in this area. Um, most people applying have been applying for years before they get their training contract completed. Um, I am also on the committee of the Law Society's Ethnic Minority Lawyers Division, which supports solicitors from minority ethnic backgrounds, allowing their voices to be heard and creating opportunities for career development. So I'd recommend to follow EM Lawyers Division on Instagram and on LinkedIn, search the Law Society Ethnic Minority Lawyers Division. We regularly post mentoring and work experience opportunities and schemes for ethnic minorities um, and some other good um, Instagrams to follow are aspiring solicitors, urban lawyers, um, and you can also become a student member of Resolution, which are a family law organisation committing to the constructive resolution of family disputes. So that's all from me. So thanks for listening. If you have any more questions, then you can connect with me on LinkedIn, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you DM me. Wonderful. I think that was a that was a fantastically thorough um, and and concise uh, uh, bit of uh, uh, infomercial really for getting into law. So you, you gave all sorts of um, uh, tips on how to make it work through the education process. You gave some information about 
uh, you know, what are the different avenues to get um, qualified to work and then professionally what, what um, ways there are forward uh, in order to get experience. So that sort of leads well to one of the questions that we have been uh, sent uh, earlier before the um, uh, webinar uh, that I wanted to ask um, all of you actually. The question is what are the best universities to apply to and are there any scholarship opportunities? I suppose because we have um, you know, uh, between Lawrence and Leila and yourself, Victoria, we, we could probably give suggestions about at least three different countries, UK, Canada, and, and the US in terms of, let's go first on what are some of the best universities to apply to, or I suppose in the case of uh, UK, it's a, it's, a, it's a different process than it is in, in the United States and Canada. So what are the other ways to get qualified for law? Um, maybe we could start with, with Leila. Leila, would you like to tell us about what are the best sure. universities to apply to in the U.S.? So in the U.S., you have to complete your four-year degree, on your undergraduate degree, and then you can apply to law school, and you can and it, it's general. So it doesn't matter what you major in in undergrad. If you're getting an undergraduate degree in the U.K., and then you want to go to the U.S. for law school, I think it's fine. You just have to take the law school admission test, um, and you just need to have your four-year or your three-year degree. I would say choose the easiest degree to get the best grades. Mm -hmm. so like, let's say you want to go to law school. Unless you want to be a patent lawyer, then you need to have a technical degree, um, like a science or engineering background. Uh, because it's good. If you want to get into those top schools, you need to have top grades and you need to have top scores. And to get those top scores, you, you're going to probably need to invest in a, in a prep course which they cost about $5,000 sometimes to prep you for those exams. Um, but there are so many law schools in the US. I mean, even if you don't get into the top 10, um, let's, say, let's say you're in the US, I would recommend going to a state school so you can pay less tuition and they're just as great. Like UCLA, University of Virginia, University of North Carolina, they're all state schools. And if you live in those states for usually a year, you can get in-state residency, which means your tuition will be cut in half. And those schools are just as great as some of the big ones like Harvard and Yale. Um, so, and then scholarships. It's difficult as an international student to get scholarships, even as a domestic student. But for example, if you work hard, my friend just uh, found funding for, she's going to start Georgetown, um, do, she's going to do her LLM. She did her law degree in the UK. And now she's going to Georgetown to do her LLM. And she was able to fundraise for her half her tuition just by asking uh, different companies and her parents asked around people they knew. And a lot of people are willing to fund you if they believe in you. Um, it took her a few months, but she was able to, to fundraise and find sponsors. So it is possible. You don't always have to get a scholarship just from the school. You should ask your community also. Um, so, and, 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 and certainly there are many organizations like Persia mm -hmm. in the United States that are, um, in a position to offer scholarships to, mm -hmm. uh, to students based on merit or, or based on needs. So that's or diversity, certain minority groups, they will give scholarships. Yeah. Yes. Wonderful. Um, Lawrence, over to you. What are your recommendations for best universities or other approaches to qualifying law? Um, I, I can't really speak about best universities in Canada, to be honest with you. I can only speak about the UK because I don't know enough about the Canadian universities. Um, oh, do we? Oh, yeah. So um, one thing that um, I mean, the, the, there are the top universities, the classic ones, right? Oxbridge and Durham and UCL and so forth. And obviously, these are things that you can achieve. Um, I think law rightly or wrongly, probably wrongly, is still quite traditional in the sense that what university you go to does still make a difference. So obviously the more uh, renowned or famous the university, then better chances of getting um, that job or role that you're, achieve, you're hoping to achieve. But at the same time, I think um, obviously you should try your best and get into the best university that you personally can. But what is more important, I think, in my view, is one, what you do once you're in university. Just getting into a top university actually won't quite cut it because 
law can be, and especially if you want to become a barrister, it can be so incredibly um, competitive. The fact that you have a first from Cambridge or a top mark from Ox Oxford, for example, will make some difference, but that's not what will determine whether you will, one, become a successful lawyer, and also if others would see that potential in you. The extracurricular activities that you do whilst you're at university, in my view at least, is equally, if not more important. So I think I, I would echo to some extent what um, Leila just said, that, you know, it, 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 it's not just about the university you get to. And I, I would personally try to um, move away from stressing so much about what's the best university. I think you should do your best. And that's quite a personal question as well. It depends on your circumstances, your geographical location and so forth. Um, and really the most important thing I would say is what you do once you're at university. Just because you got into university, it doesn't mean that it's the end. It's actually quite the beginning of your journey. Um, in terms of scholarships, I, I think Layla's covered it, so I don't need to really. You, you and Layla both are, um, have covered it. There are many different um, opportunities. If you want to become a barrister, you're in. We'll have scholarships. Um, there are various organizations that promote access to the bar. They also have scholarships. Your university will obviously have scholarships and so forth. I wanted to piggyback just quickly on what Lauren said. Another thing you can do is is write. You can write a blog or you can publish. A lot of think tanks will even pay you if you write articles on a certain subject. Like if you're one of those people who knows exactly what area of law you want to practice, you can start writing about it and uh, while you're an undergrad. And that makes you a much more um, a candidate that schools will want to invest in, both to accept you and to fund you. Um, so, so think about that too. And if, if you do know exactly what you want to do, you should you you should um, even offer to work for free if you won't get if you can't get one of those coveted internships. If you if you tell anyone that you want to work for free for them, even if it's a one day a week, uh, they're not going to say no to you. They're going to give you something to do. So just think about that as well. Wonderful, wonderful suggestions. That's that's really great. Uh, Victoria, dear, over to you. You gave a lot of tips already, but I think it would be wonderful to hear from you also what universities or, you know, as you said earlier, maybe build a little bit more on what you were sharing in terms of um, alternative avenues uh, into qualifying as a lawyer. Um, so I agree. Everything Shafa said is that I, I was going to say the same. Um, you know, it's, I, I'd say that certain law firms, if you're looking at those magic circle international corporate firms, will be looking for more of the Oxford, Cambridge and the Russell Group universities. But I have seen people become amazing and really well-known solicitors and barristers from, from universities that are at the bottom of the league tables. So it doesn't, if, if you end up going to a, a non-Russell group or a non-Oxford university, it doesn't define you for the rest of your career. It's, it's, it's just harder to get the first stepping stone, which is the training contract. But what I found is that once you qualify, the, those kind of firms that that would have taken you on as a trainee because your grades or your university was not what, what they wanted, they will see they now will seem to consider you once you're qualified. So it, you just have to get that training contract. And once you're qualified, you can move to those firms if that's what you want. Mm, exactly. Yes, and, and and it really depends on also what you, what the area is that you're really passionate about. So you know, um, uh, for instance, if, if you're really interested in human rights law, Essex has a wonderful clinic and York has a wonderful clinic that, um, you know, is of great deal of interest to anyone who wants to become a practitioner in human rights law. So those are also available. Um, in case of Canada, maybe I could just add that in particular, um, Dalhousie University, University of Victoria and, and uh, University of Toronto, are very well known for their faculties of uh, for the faculty of law. So if anyone is interested in studying in Canada, in fact, at Persia Educational Foundation, we do get um, a number of inquiries from Iranian students who are here who want to then go on to Canada. So these are three particular universities that are really top notch in terms of the law programs that they offer. 
uh, uh, with regard to scholarship opportunities, of course, again, here in the UK, if you're entering the United Kingdom, there are uh, a number of uh, agencies and organizations that work with universities that um, are ab able to um, offer partial or full scholarship or grant or bursaries uh, to students who want to come and study in the United Kingdom. The best time of the year to apply for scholarships, um, if I may interject at this point and, and speak a little bit more, is usually during the early months of the year, not the academic year, but the calendar year. So around January, February is really when, when people could get going with applying for scholarships. And by about April or May, you have the results of the scholarships announced and that that sort of makes it possible for you to um, pursue your education with a bit of financial backing. So the next question that we have received that um, may be something that we could perhaps comment on is um, what is your advice each mm -hmm. in terms of um, managing work life balance, given the tremendous pressure that exists on individuals who work in law, whether as solicitor, barrister, or uh, in other uh, avenues that are available, um, as for instance, being an in house counsel. Uh, what do you suggest? What are your recommendations? I have some recommendations, and they're, they have to do with self development work and self improvement work, which is these are things that we don't necessarily learn in school. And these are things I've learned along the way. And I wanted to just list a few. Uh, setting boundaries, the ability to say no, communicating your needs, um, being flexible, delegate tasks, ask for help, and ask your boss or your manager what you should prioritize and keep a working list or a tracker of every task on that you're working on to always be able to show your workload. So when your boss comes and puts dumps something else on your desk, you have to say, okay, how do you want me to prioritize this? Should I put the other one to the side and work on this one right now? You have to communicate. Um, otherwise, they don't read your mind. They don't know what everything you're working on. Uh, delegate tasks, um, you know, sometimes you're going to need help. You're going to have to get, give your assistant some work to do or something like that. The other thing is um, don't be a people pleaser. <laughs> take care of your physical and mental health um, and ask for feedback take criticism as positive ask questions uh, if you have an abusive boss find a new job and be growth minded not fixed minded and if you don't know what that means i highly recommend you read the book growth mindset by carol dweck she's a professor at stanford university Wonderful. Anyone yeah, else? That's really good. Um, I have to be honest, I'm terrible with work life balance. Um, absolutely terrible. Part of it is because I, as I said already, I really love what I do. And so it it almost sometimes it it just it doesn't feel like I'm working, which sounds like a bizarre and potentially very depressing thing to say. But um yeah, I think. One thing that I've noticed, though, is that I am probably better at achieving work-life balance more so now than before, because the more experience I get, the less time it takes for me to do the tasks that I have to do. And so perhaps initially, um, if, if you are not achieving work-life balance, what you really want to, don't beat yourself up, because it, there is going to be a learning curve, and you are going to get better at it. And I certainly hope you are better at it than I am. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the advice that Leila gave obviously is very, very helpful. Fantastic, thank you so much. Victoria, dear, what are, what are your thoughts on this particular question? You're on mute. Yeah, a mixture of what Leila's already said and Chaffa. I don't, I don't, I think I have a very good work-life balance, but then when I look at other people, I think that I do have a good work-life balance, but it also depends on what area of law you're in, and I think there are some areas of law, if you want a good work-life balance, then you should go to certain firms and go into certain areas of law, because if you want to earn loads of money, you're not going to have a good work-life balance, which is why there are these certain firms 
pay so much money. There are some firms that pay huge sums of money, but they have sleeping pods in the office for people to have power naps in because they don't go to home at night. So it's it's a difficult one, really. But I think I feel like. A solicitor is not a nine to five job. I don't know any solicitors that come in at nine and leave at five and don't do anything extra. It is a job that you're expected to do more. And when you have clients that are humans and you're dealing with people's finances or children and or things with really sensitive allegations, it's very hard to stop working at a certain time when you feel that that's then you're, you're, they're the, that's the goal that you're trying to achieve. Well, it sounds to me like um, it isn't so much of a struggle as it is the fact that you're really approaching your work in a spirit of service. So that's that's actually quite um, uh, uh, important and, and uh, wonderful to acknowledge and to benefit from. So thank you for, for both you and I think Lawrence earlier, and, and of course we all know from, from Leila's many contributions to the community. Uh, one of the reasons why we were really eager to have the three of you as part of this webinar is because each one of you, um, as far as um, you know, I've certainly experienced and many others have also experienced with you, um, testify to the fact that you um, are not in this for prestige or money or power or position. You're, you're doing what you're doing because you want to serve others, which is perhaps why um, you express what you did, Victoria, or as, as Lauren said, you know, he, he feels almost unjustified for getting paid for what he does, or Leila with many of the projects that she, she takes on. Perhaps this is why she's trying to learn to say no, because she does so much for everybody. And this is really um, what individuals who are involved with law must manifest and must embody because um, the very definition of this job is to enable individuals to, to lead better lives. Um, and, and if there is one thing that we need more of in our world today is uh, individuals, professionals who understand law in light of service, in light of community building, in light of building connections between individuals, the over um, litigious approach that we've had uh, so far when it comes to the world of law has uh, managed to kill uh, connection <laughs> and, and to do damage to communities and, and bodies and organizations. So it's refreshing, it's wonderful to hear uh, these words uh, from such wonderful stellar panel of young professionals and certainly uh, earlier on victoria when you were talking about these alternative modes of um accessing law that are now emerging in family law are, are really um hopeful signs because if anything the institution of family which is the building block of every society has suffered a great deal in terms of an over litigious approach so it's wonderful to hear that alternative modes of dispute resolution are now being practiced and even sharing a solicitor is, is fantastic. One example that I want to give because family law is so important and, and um, in many of the, uh, you know, sort of social media channels with immigrant populations, including the, the uh, uh, Iranian population in the UK, you notice that there is a constant demand for dealing with family issues. And it's, it's wonderful to hear that, um, you know, in some of the uh, cases in the United States, judges are now um, asking individuals who uh, parents who are divorcing to keep children in the matrimonial home and for the parents to change residence. So really, we are changing our approach to how we um, deal with uh, family life before, during and after uh, marriage. Um, there is one question that I think I want to bring that has uh, come in. Um, and that is from someone who says that there are qualified pharmacists here in the United Kingdom and they want to pursue a career in medical law, but they have no idea how to go about it. Um, Leila, would you be able to maybe address that in particular and then we'll tackle some other questions? Mm -hmm. So I think they, they mean they want to work for a pharmaceutical company in-house or they might mean medical malpractice. I don't think so. Medical law, um, they're just mentioning medical law. So let's yeah, just okay. comment. So uh, I'm not really entirely sure about the UK route, but if they want to do the US, they could, uh, uh, they would have to, they would have to study for the LSAT 
and then enter a three-year degree law degree program in the U.S. And then when they come out, they can do an LLM in pharmaceutical law, or they can try to get hired at a pharmaceutical company based on their experience uh, being a pharmacist, which I think they would have a really good chance at. Uh, it's not going to be a, a quick process to become an, an, an in-house pharmaceutical and medical device lawyer, but it's possible. And it's actually great. I, I know doctors who've gone to law school as well. They, they call it a JDMD. You can do dual programs. Um, maybe the others can comment on how they could pursue it in the UK. Um, there, are, there are avenues there for for uh, individuals who are interested in this. Certainly, um, you could do GDL, as uh, Victoria, I think, referred to earlier. Uh, and also in Cambridge University, there are opportunities to study at a law school. Um, or, um, again, coming from my background, um, uh, there are individuals who pursue human rights law, um, which combined with a medical degree is quite useful in terms of promoting access to the right to health, which is one of our five uh, positive rights, socioeconomic rights, and an increasingly important one. So Cambridge University comes to mind. Again, Essex University is a wonderful place to uh, explore possibilities at the clinic there if there is an interest in this area. And um, something else uh, they can consider is they could do a master's in public health or something else, and they could work in a pharmaceutical company doing that without and, and not even going to law school. Wonderful, that's that's a great piece of advice. Um, what are the um, challenges that that you are able to tackle at this point? Um, and with those challenges, what are the opportunities that you perhaps see in the field of law that you uh, want to comment on? Um, Victoria. Um, I think a lot of the, cha the challenges in law in this country are to do with being privileged and, and not so privileged and the amount of money that your parents could help you with because it's unfortunately you need a lot of money to fund the qualifications that you need and there are times when you earn such little money that without your parents support you wouldn't be able to survive which is wrong and it, the you know the law society the sra they're very aware of these problems there's also a large disparity in the grades that ethnic minority students are achieving in their LPC results. And the pass mark for white students is a lot higher than non-white students. And this is also something that the Law Society and the SRA are looking into to find out why this is happening. One of the reasons why the SQE was brought in was to try and stop this. And the first round of SQ exams showed the exact same problem that the LPC had. So I would say that that's probably the biggest challenge is, which is why ethnic minority students, students should, when they find these mentoring opportunities, these scholarship opportunities, the work experience opportunities, they should take them. They deserve them. And these, are the, these schemes are there to help them in an uh, area that they might find challenging due to their race. So I think that that's probably one of the, one of the big challenges. Yeah, that's really good. I think um, that that's, I think, uh, really helpful. And I completely agree with that. I think access to becoming a lawyer is actually becoming a bit of a challenge. Um, I mean, Victoria, just the fact of what you said, how you wanted to pursue a career in criminal law, but because of the legal aid cuts, that was an unviable option for you. I mean, that, that you know, at the moment, barristers across the country, uh, criminal barristers are actually striking because of the legal aid rates being so low that it's practically unworkable. Many of my extremely talented colleagues at my chambers is are also leaving criminal law, uh, practicing criminal law. And and I think that is a huge challenge where there is this view that somehow, um, yeah, that, that legal aid should be available, legal aid should be low as possible, because what we forget is that criminal law is there obviously to protect us all. And having very robust and refined criminal law is in everybody's best interest. And I'm just talking about criminal law at the moment, but really in any area of law, in immigration as well, they've completely cut 
legal aid is extremely low, low compared to private um, private fees. And the difficulty with that is that you, you dis dissuade hugely and a very bright and talented people from particular areas of law. There is a huge push and encouragement, if you will, at law schools to, part, to practice corporate and commercial law because it pays so well and it draws excellent, excellent candidates to those areas of law. And, you know, um, broadly, that, that obviously assists in refining the law and fine tuning it really, really well, because if you have really great lawyers, you're arguing really um, interesting, if you think about two, two rough um, stones, you're rubbing against them and you're refining it, you're smoothing it out. Whereas if you're not attracting top quality lawyers in a particular area of law, then in the long run, that's going to harm that particular area of law. And so I, I do think that, um, that that is a challenge that we're going to continue to face, I'm afraid, uh, with areas of law that rely on legal aid, uh, that being reduced, that will affect the quality of the lawyers you're going to attract as well. Um, so I do think that that's something that we're going to yeah, be seeing throughout. So the opposite is kind of happening in the U.S. where law schools are, are attempting more flexible ways to get in. I mean, the U.S. is huge. There are like, I don't know, thousands of law schools, first tier, second tier, third tier, fourth tier. Um, the only problem is tuition might be high for someone who is residing overseas. But for something like, for an example, for the person who wrote that they're a pharmacist, if you're coming from already another professional background, you have a better chance, especially if it's something unique like pharmacy, which is not really law related, they want you. You have a better chance of getting a scholarship to 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 US law school just using your profession. Or if you're a nurse or just anything you can think of, they want people with interesting backgrounds. They don't want a traditional English literature or philosophy major who is going to law school. So you're at an advantage in that sense. And then if you are a US resident, um, there's a law school for you. If you can't get into the top ones, you can get into a second tier or a third tier one, uh, yeah. just because it's 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 a different landscape. Wonderful, wonderful tips and suggestions and and um, info bites really for us to to um, think about and to uh, pursue further and to explore more. Um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time, so I want to thank our panelists and uh, in conclusion, I want to also add, actually with the challenges that we're facing, there is one other area of law that uh, there are many opportunities in, and that is international law. So um, uh, in this regard, Persia Educational Foundation, as part of our sort of TED-inspired series that we did uh, a few years back in uh, collaboration with Manoto Television, uh, a series that was called Deed Gah. One of our speakers um, um, who has been working at the International Criminal Court for a number of years um, spoke about the challenges and opportunities that exist in international law. Um, and so that's available on our website. If you visit www.persia.education, you're able to see Mr. Abtahi speak about opportunities that exist in the world of international Can law. I just say something real quick? Sure, yes. So you mentioned international law, and I'm so glad you did, because one of the questions that we didn't get to is what are the best areas of law to specialize in? And I just wanted to say, really think about, do you want to be in one place for the rest of your life type of lawyer? like where you're going to have your own law firm or you're going to build a practice or you're going to be someone in court and you have to learn all the court rules or do you want to be someone who can maybe move around that should also influence the kind of law that you go into because if you're like a family lawyer you have to be there you can't do it remotely and you can't uh suddenly move to another country because all the laws are different um so think about that when you're considering what field you want to go into Absolutely. And also um, some of the other opportunities that we see emerge in post-conflict, post-crisis uh, countries is that the forms of dealing with law and justice are changing. For, for instance, we remember, of course, from the case of South Africa, where, um, you know, the, the way people dealt with accessing human rights was entirely different than what we see emerge 
in uh, the case of uh, Bosnia and uh, Herzegovina or in the case of uh, Rwanda, the, the way we're approaching law, as, as Victoria said in the beginning, is just changing. So maybe there are ways other than litigation to be able to promote law and access to our legal rights. And so uh, that's called the rule of law. And my friend practices that. So that's another area. If you're interested in shaping the laws of another country, um, you can look into the rule of law type of type of work. Yes, yes. Um, so there are many, many different uh, ways forward. Um, law is certainly and its infancy, actually. Uh, we may think that um, we've, we've figured everything out, but uh, with the emergence of international uh, law, we are, you know, really at the earliest moments of dawn of the world of law. So the opportunities are immense. Uh, creativity is called for, and a sense of service is really necessary, as our three panelists today have demonstrated, in order to make sure that um, new vistas are explored. Um, and if one approaches it with creativity, one approaches it with, with the spirit of service, then success is uh, a certain factor, um, um, as well as accessing prosperity and, and uh, promotion of justice in society. So I just wanted to thank our panelists one more time for the time that they have put into preparing for this webinar. I wanted to thank all of you for joining, whether here in this Zoom or online. Uh, I hope that you've enjoyed this wonderful webinar with these uh, uh, three uh, uh, brilliant minds who are, are helping us through the world of law. Um, many questions and messages are still pouring in. Unfortunately, we ran out of time, but as you know, the uh, social media handles for our panelists are available on, on Persia's um, Instagram, Facebook, and, and LinkedIn. Please visit, get in touch with them. Um, one of the reasons why Persia brings many young professionals to these webinars is to promote them. Uh, and so we hope that many more individuals contact Leila, Lawrence, and uh, Victoria as, as clients. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please join us in September when we begin a new season of Persia webinars. And please stay tuned for many more educational and um, uh, professional opportunities through our channels. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.